ورحمة الله وبركاته. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we are coming to the uh, end of this workshop, and uh, we would like to uh, conclude it with uh, this interesting lecture. So far, Alhamdulillah, uh, we hope that uh, we have made a good benefit out of the lectures we have seen, uh, and hopefully uh, we'll be able to get copies of it for uh, any Islamic center or any uh, Muslim who is willing to have a copy at a minimal cost, inshallah. Uh, the, uh, the next lecture will be given again by Brother Gary Miller, who will address us on the uh, topic, Modern History of Christianity. Without any delay, I would uh, leave the uh, microphone for Brother Gary Miller, and then we'll have the uh, session open for uh, discussion after he finishes. Hopefully, uh, he will make it brief so that we break up early, so that you can uh, leave for the brothers who are coming out of town. Thank you. Let me uh, start off with what is uh, actually a whole subject in itself, and it has been pursued. It was the subject of a PhD uh, dissertation several years ago. Um, it would be about 25 years ago, I believe, by an American Muslim who in studying comparative religion and finally earning his uh, degree, took as his thesis that the Bible doesn't say which religion it teaches. Sounds like an interesting idea. Uh, defended his thesis. It's uh, right now at the printers, because finally somebody decided that this ought to be printed more widely, and uh, a publishing house is uh, just putting it together. Uh, so I advise you to keep an eye out for it. I don't know what the uh, title of it may finally come to be when it's in print. But mainly it illustrated the kind of uh, situation that the uh, Christian community is in. This is not a, a criticism, it's just a state of affairs, which is appreciated by most of the Christian community, in fact. That they may have a book, but different types of churches give it different value. Why this brother... Uh, whose name is um, Shabazz. Uh, why he was stating his case is, of course, a subject of many pages, but it basically was saying that what you have in the Bible is not a book of doctrine. For the most part, it is a book about some people and what they said and did. So uh, I think you can see my point. If uh, you had somebody who had lived a lifetime in a certain city and somebody asks you uh, what was his religion and they tell you well you can read the story of his life in this book that's not quite the same as telling you what his religion is the bible tells the history of people uh, in a sense from the first man uh, down to the first century tells you what many different people did and the battles they fought and the kings they had and the sons that were born to them and all of these things, but that's not quite the same as a book that says this is the religion of this and that and the other. There are some statements like that, but that's not generally the nature of the book. It's long lists of names and places and events and so on. In fact, what you will find is that those few statements which seem to say a thing about the nature of the religion practiced by these people that the story concerns, they stand out so much from the rest of the book that some people will paint them on signs and stick them up on the wall, I see, because it stands out so much. You know, in a sense, we may decorate the wall sometimes with uh, some verse from the Quran, but is there some particular verse that we would never take and stick up on the wall? Some of them may not seem to be all by themselves uh, much of a, a statement to hang on a wall, but as a matter of fact, if you look far enough within two or three verses of something, anything would be a nice thing to take out and maybe make it a little bigger and put it up there where you'll see it every day and think about it. Everything is of some very definite value. There's no statements you think, well, that may have been interesting once, but it's not interesting anymore. Or this talks about something that really doesn't matter anymore. Whereas the Bible contains long lists of how many sons were born to such and such a man and so on. It's not exactly the kind of thing you want to 
take hours and hours and paint this in big letters and hang it on the wall. It doesn't mean very much to anybody anymore. That's the difference in the kinds uh, of books. So in this way, instead of just exploring so much more of this particular issue, the man is trying to point out that a group of people may have a religion, but they don't really have a book of the religion. They have a book of events concerning some people who used to practice a religion which isn't really explained anywhere. So it is that the religion takes many forms. Uh, I know that uh, used to have a lot of Nigerian students in uh, Canada that came for these two and three year engineering courses. And they uh, lived in a society where in many places you had equal numbers of Christians and Muslims in a city. And they'd tell me how their Christian friends used to think it was so strange how they could be standing somewhere and they hear the Yazan and they turn and look, say, oh, there's the mosque, and they go to the mosque to pray. The Christians thought that was kind of strange. <laughs> the Muslims thought it was strange that, you no, know, these people, if you're standing and talking with them and they say, oh, it's time for church, he may get in the car or bus and he goes clear across town. He passes many churches on the way till he gets to his church. See, we don't have different kinds of mosques. They, uh, any mosque will do probably, unless you've heard some terrible thing about what goes on there, but generally speaking, the Muslim sees a mosque, oh, this is fine, <laughs> and he goes to pray. You don't have different kinds of Muslims in, in that uh, regard. Muslims may have some different opinions about certain matters, but they don't disagree about Islam. They may disagree about uh, how far apart you put your feet when you pray, but they don't disagree about praying. Uh, they may have certain strong opinions of different things, but they're not matters of religion, technically speaking. They're matters of practices, habits, traditions, or what's the best idea of what will do the job best, but not about doctrine, not about Islam. On the other hand, you have different kinds, as I say, of, of churches. Largely do, it would seem, to the fact that you don't really have a thorough description of the religion. So you have to sort of fit it together according to what you do have, so that a lot of what is practiced in a church is not something that you can look up and say, well, it's because on this page it says this and that and so on. <coughs> People have somehow extended uh, their own ideas and said, well, it seems to fit with what is said here and there. Some churches place a great deal of emphasis on music. And about the best they can do to justify it, I suppose, uh, at least in any portion of the Christian uh, scriptures is to say, well, it says here that Jesus sang a hymn with his disciples, so maybe we should sing hymns or, or something, uh, and that's a translation already of a Greek, Greek word, sing a hymn. Uh, that's not possibly precisely what was meant there uh, in these words anyway. Uh, they pass over a lot of other things. Jesus sets a, an example. You heard it quoted earlier today. He sets the example according to the reports that when he used to greet people, he greeted them, peace be with you. He even said on one occasion, when you go out and you meet someone, greet him, peace be with you. Uh, Christians don't generally do that, but you'd think if they'd like to imitate what did Jesus used to do, this ought to be one thing they could use. So some may, more likely they don't. But the mistaken impression, I suppose, that many Christians have is that, but my religion is a God-given thing. It's like I said about polygamy earlier. The average Christian may say, my religion allows one wife for one man. Well, it doesn't say that anywhere in the sources of his religion. His officials may insist on that or recommend it, or it may be a well-established tradition, but it's not really part of his religion in a sense that there's a page somewhere in a book where it says that this is the case. Christian itself is a nickname. It's a point not known by very many, but no one can dispute it. It's in the Bible book of Acts, chapter 11. It's talking about a period of time years after the time of Jesus. And it says it was in the city of Antioch on this occasion that the disciples, followers of Jesus were first called Christians. It was a name given to them by outsiders. They always talked about the Christ. Those are the Christ people, the Christians. It's not a name Jesus used, a nickname. I guess most of them liked it, and so they kept it. 
it's an important point. The Quran doesn't make that mistake. What do you suppose Arabic Christians call themselves? Call themselves Christians. Masahin, the Messiah people. Because they don't be confused. Messiah equals Christ. Christ is from the Greek word that means the same thing as Messiah mean in the Hebrew. But the Quran doesn't call the disciples of Jesus Masahin. It talks about the Nasara, which is the only thing you'll ever find in the Bible actually applied to them as reported in the time of Jesus. They were the sect of the Nazarenes. Whatever that means is beside the point. But if you see what I'm getting at, if everyone is calling themselves Christian and you're writing a book that talks about them, you might be tempted to call them Christian. That's what they call themselves. Uh, that would be a mistake if you put the word Christian on the lips of Jesus or the disciples in your book because they didn't call themselves by that name at that time. It would be an anachronism, if you see what I mean. It would be like writing a story about ancient Rome and you talk about somebody wearing a wristwatch. It would be something out of place in time. It's an interesting little detail of accuracy in the Quran. In trying to explain some of the things that divide people or why you find the situation as it is today, uh, keep in mind that in the first place you will probably know more than most people know on the street. It's not widely known. It's not like people sit and discuss these things. When I first met uh, the woman that I later married, I asked her, she was working where I worked, I asked her about herself. She said, I'm a Christian. I said, which church? She told me the church. I said, you must believe this and this and this, certain points. She said, no. I said, go ask. She says, no, no, they never talk about that. We don't believe that. She went and asked the pastor, came back to me and said, we believe that. Officially, it's not talked about. That's in, in many cases. Certain things are talked about, certain things aren't. She had the same uh, uh, experience with our neighbor sometime after that. When she said to her neighbor one day, who every day went to, or every Sunday went to Trinity United Church. The United Church is a sort of a Canadian institution that's uh, it's the, it's the greatest number of people, I suppose. But the name of this particular church was Trinity, that building, Trinity United Church. So she asked a neighbor one time, do you know what Trinity means? She goes there every Sunday. The woman said, no, actually. So my wife said, well, the Trinity, by definition, is, and she told her, one, two, three. And the woman said, uh, you know, was kind of surprised at that, had a strange look on her face. And my wife said, do you believe that? She said, I don't think so. See, it's not generally talked about. It is in some churches, yes, but by and large, certain things are not really discussed. So you may if you're equipped in some ways no more than the average person. It frequently happens now in North American society. I get uh, telephone calls from people in different places. They are Americans who've come to Islam, and then they get into discussions with Christians, and they're hearing about something they didn't know about before, and they call and ask. Now tell me, I talked to a Christian yesterday, and he told me this and this and this, and I know by what he said that, well, what you were talking to was one of these kinds of Christians, not uh, you know, a particular denomination. They're the ones who say that. And oh, this is a new idea to them. They start to appreciate, you mean there's different kinds, and uh, they believe different things, and so on. That, that comes as news to them. So it is that, in fact, there are so many different kinds of beliefs that there's almost nothing, almost nothing, that you can say about Christianity, and every Christian will say, yes, that's true. Just about anything that you might say about Christianity, you'll find some Christian who will say, well, they believe it, but we don't. We're the true Christians. Or maybe vice versa. They may say, yes, we believe that, they don't, and so on. They, uh, in other words, there's no statement broad enough. Virtually anything a Muslim will say. You'll find some Christian will say, you're right. Just about anything. You want to say God is one, Jesus is not the Son of God? There's Christians who say that. You want to say, don't eat pork? There's Christians who say that, as we mentioned before. They come in a wide range. So be careful if you say, the Christians, they say this. The Quran is careful in that way. When it talks about certain issues, it says, those among the people of the book who say such and such and so, 
singles them out or say a party of them say such and such doesn't usually paint them all the same color with one wide sweep of a, a brush it's different kinds now ancient history may contain a lot of the origins of Christianity and that's an interesting subject there's a number of books available that way um, There's one called Pagan Christs. There's one called the Paganism in Our Christianity. Um, there's various other books on that subject. If you browse through the religious section of a, a library, you should be able to find these, which will show you. And these are by Christian authors, not by people who hated Christianity. Christian authors will tell you how well, this was an ancient pagan belief and it has come into our belief. But that's okay. <laughs> tell you why, usually. Um, but what explains more the reality of the modern situation is an understanding of Christianity in the last few hundred years to go from the time of the Protestant Reformation when up until about 500 years ago Europe was mostly all under one church there were always people in this place or that place somebody who was against that they stood as small groups you have Catharists, Socinians, uh, Unitarians people in various places right back through the centuries. As I mentioned, there's a book by J.N.D. Kelly called Early Christian Doctrine. He states there, this is a Christian writing. It's a book that's basic in Christian schools, that is uh, seminaries, people study for the ministry, which tells you that it was a common heresy in the first century that Jesus wasn't crucified. Heresy is his word. It means lie. Well, whether he thinks it's a lie or not, the point is he says it's common. Lots of people used to say it. Lots of Christians used to say it. A heresy is supposed to be a lie that somebody within the system tells. He's a heretic. This man can't be a Christian anymore. <laughs> he's guilty of a heresy is how it works. So he's saying this is not some new Muslim issue. This is an old thing lots of people used to say. People who said we follow Jesus, some of them used to deny it. But in any case, there have been people like that here, there, down through the centuries, but you really come to a, a, a major split in the Protestant Reformation and this gives an understanding, very generally speaking, of the two frames of mind that exist in Christianity today. Uh, Martin Luther was a priest who became unsatisfied with himself, very much so, uh, uh, saying that, I want to do good, and I always do bad. I try hard to do good, but I keep doing bad. And he became so disgusted with this uh, difficulty that it occurred to him there must be a different way. I'm not capable of doing good. I always do bad no matter how much I want to do good. And so he came up with a, a different idea. It used to be that people, I'm speaking broadly and simply, but people used to regard sin as a thing you did that's wrong. You did a bad thing, you sinned. Luther said, well, no. We do bad things, yes, but sin is something that happens before we did the bad thing. Sin is when we didn't believe. Our sin is unfaith. I failed to have faith. That's where I sinned. I didn't have faith anymore. And of course, after that, I do bad things. So in that way, that vague term faith tended to put a new idea on the intellectual processes that people carried out which has become widespread today. I've seen little pamphlets handed out. you find them around here, I'm sure, where people will tell you about sins. And they'll tell you sins, bad things that people do and so on, are uh, they steal and they're proud and this and this and this. And one of the sins they will list down there is they doubt. Doubt is supposed to be sin. See, a doubt is when your mind is saying, wait, something's not right here. The man might be lying or there may be a mistake. That's doubt. It's a mechanism in the mind that signals the alarm, telling you, wait, 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 before you go on. Maybe something's wrong here. Maybe not. But doubt is a mechanism in the thinking faculty. But when you label that as a sin, it's a bad thing to do, to doubt, and then you make it a crime question things. One 
famous evangelist who said when he was a young man, every time he thought about Trinity, his head hurt around the back, he said. And then one day he promised he wouldn't think about it anymore. He promised God, I won't worry about the Trinity anymore. And he said the headache stopped. Well, yes, they will, but <laughs> you can take the batteries out of your smoke alarm, too. It won't make that awful noise anymore. You say, that smoke alarm is it's such an irritating noise. When it goes off, I'll take the batteries out. Yes, but someday you may burn up in a fire, too, because you, you've taken away what was performing a valuable service. You can pull maybe a couple of wires out of the back of a computer. It will still work most of the time, but every so often it will do a silly thing because you have interfered with the proper functioning. The mind will do that, too. If you resolve, I am never going to doubt. I'll do everything else, but... If anything caused me to doubt, I simply won't doubt, I'll press on. You're going to be led to some strange results from time to time because you tampered with the, the circuitry. That's a, a healthy kind of an attitude. Uh, by the way, uh, the way that this is solved is usually in a, what's called a tautology. People turn a tight little circle, they'll tell you, I've seen it in print, they'll tell you, if you have doubts, this is a sin. What you must do in order to beat that sin is you must stop doubting. And after that, you won't have any doubts. Well, think about it. <laughs> you see, they told you, you want to quit doubting? It's easy. What you do is, you don't doubt. It's like saying, you want to stop smoking? Easy. Don't smoke. The rest is easy. It, it doesn't really give you very much. It can give you anything. Now, keep in mind, I'm saying this idea of putting doubt as uh, and sin as unfaith as being the real crime uh, may have its origins in Martin Luther or somebody else, I don't know, but it's come down to influence a large part of Christian thought today. And it's not clear cut. If you meet a Catholic, he may think like a Protestant. You may meet a Protestant who thinks like a Catholic. It's not a hard and fast rule, but these are two different kinds of thinking that you're going to meet. So, in any case, if you're talking to somebody, at least find out which type of thinking does he do. Does he believe that his religion is a matter of faith, or does he believe that the things that are true are things we should discover, we should think about, we find the true things? Or does he believe that, well, no, I'll sort of find the truth all at once, and then I'll promise to believe it? Is it by investigation, or is it by surrender? Both, both types of people tell you, well, investigate, but the one type will tell you, investigate, uh, and what he means is, take this. Uh, it doesn't really mean investigate. In fact, as somebody uh, told me one time, I'd itemized a number of arguments as we did earlier, and he stood up in the audience, he says, you're right, what I believe is unbelievable. A man can't believe what I believe unless he has the gift of faith from God. And when I asked him later, he came around, I said, how do you get the gift of faith from God? He said, there's only one way to get it. You have to believe all these things. <laughs> Again, it doesn't give you anything. And you can't believe it without this thing. You don't get this thing until you believe it. But what I want to stress here is that find out how somebody seems to function. If faith is his key, then he has a couple of problems. He has on the one thing a product that he can't deliver. That is, if a man says, I have faith, he might even be right, but he can't give you any of this. So uh, keep that in mind. As I remember talking with somebody one time who said, I have proof such and such a thing. When I showed him his proof was insufficient, he said, no, no, I don't mean proof then. I have faith in this thing. Well, that's fine. Say you have faith then. Don't say you have proof. <laughs> because one man can give another man proof. He can't give another man faith. Faith is some kind of a thing nobody can really explain to you, I suppose. They say it's on the inside. You can't take it out and give it to somebody. In other words, you can tell somebody what you believe. It won't help him believe it unless you can show him why you believe it. Bring something out he can look at. If a man says, on the one hand, I have faith for what I believe in, it's likely this is the same man who will tell you everything I believe is here in the Bible. This is the basis of my faith. By that he means the miraculous nature of this book is what convinces me, which is somewhat inconsistent with the position that I don't need anything to see. I have faith. I don't need a thing in front of me. 
because it, it depends on which day you ask him this question. Maybe it's Monday, Wednesday, Friday, he'll tell you, what convinces me is this beautiful book, and Tuesday, Thursday, uh, he'll tell you, I don't need to see anything. I know God spoke to me, or he gave me a gift of faith. Uh, you can't really have it both ways. There's also this point, which is well known in the scientific community today, that if a man tells you anything he thinks is true, he's proposing a theory, a hypothesis, he's supposed to bring with it a test of falsification. He's supposed to offer this thing and say, and if I'm wrong, you can prove it by doing this or that or the other. Otherwise, it's not worth listening to him. If he comes to you and he says, I have a thing which is true, and you say, how could I prove you wrong? He said, there's no way. Well, <laughs> wasting your time. You have to offer some way. The Quran is full of this kind of thing, where it says, this is true, because if it were false, couldn't you do this? Or why don't you try that? And so on. Offering people the challenge, saying, and if you don't think this is a revelation, then do this, do that, try these things. But a man who says it's all wrapped up in faith isn't offering a test of falsification. A man tells you, I'm convinced this is true. You should ask him, is there something I could show you which would convince you that you're wrong? If I could find it, name it for me. And at least maybe you can plant that idea in his mind that, in fact, there is nothing. He's excluded that. And so how valuable is his belief? He believes in a thing which he has never opened it to challenge. See, you're not, you're not asking him to tell you some thing which he knows is true, but he refuses to accept. You're asking him, tell me about something, however fantastic it is, but tell me about it that if I could bring it to you, you would see that you're wrong. And at least it may make him think about the value of what he has. The Muslim can do that easily enough, you see. As I say, the Quran is filled with that kind of thing. If somebody says that to the Muslim, you should be able to say, well, all right, as a matter of fact, I'll quit being a Muslim if you can show me such and such. The Quran gives you a list of suggestions, <laughs> those kinds of things. Tell people, go away and come back, bring me one of these, and I'll <laughs> come over to your side. I hope I've explained uh, satisfactorily enough what I mean by a falsification test, ask a man, how can you be uh, proved wrong? If, on the other hand, you have somebody who has said no investigation is the answer, uh, this is maybe more helpful, but this man, too, may claim that his belief is based on the things he sees in front of him, but he may betray that later on, because if you point out to him that some of the things he believes, he hasn't brought the proof for them, he may then tell you, but these are matters of faith, and so he's crossing back over into the other man's uh, uh, school of thought. We want to stress that. This basically is the way the Quran talks about dealing with religion, that your job is not to come to the Christian and say, look, you're wrong about these things. Here's the truth. Your job is to tell him, you're right about this and this and this. But when you say this, are you sure? Bring your proof. If you have proof, then I believe it too. But if you don't have proof, it may be right, it may be wrong, but you don't know. Neither do I. Let's leave it. In other words, Islam is what you have when you clean house. If you could go through your mind and take all the things that they might be true, but you don't have proof, put them in another compartment to say, whether they're true or not, I may find out sometime, but for now I'm going to set them here. What you'll have left are just the things that you know are true. You've got proof for those. That's the foundation of Islam. That's what the non-Muslim, I suppose, if you want to call them that, is asked to do. Saying, just for now, set aside those things which you don't have proof for. What have you got left? And he should find himself much closer to you than to anything else. Now, historically, um, I hope that uh, starts to explain the two frames of mind you're going to meet in, in different kinds of churches. Some are of the opinion that to investigate is wrong. It is a matter of faith. The other will say, we must continue the investigation because we may find out we're wrong and we will make progress. This is, uh, these are people who may even be bold enough to say, you know, it may turn out, if we continue our investigation, that we've been wrong for a long time about some things. They're still open to investigation. The other group says, no, it's all finished. We know what is true. We must not investigate any further. Uh, 
the Muslim can be much more sympathetic, of course, to the attitude of, well, let's continue the process. It's compared to those who say, no, we shut off uh, the process. They will tell you, I mean, those who are committed to faith of saying everything is settled, you should learn. In fact, these are the people who learn a great deal about the Bible. But they are learning in somewhat the same way as you might say a library learns when you put a new book in it. It's just data. It's not given a, a meaning. Some of it's useless data. I have a Bible which I kept as a, an interesting souvenir. At the back, it has many pages of information. Now, you'd think if a church prints a Bible and they add some pages in the back, they're probably going to tell you some valuable things here. And what does it contain? It tells you the longest verse in the Bible is to be found in chapter so-and-so and such-and-such. -and -such. It tells you there's one verse in the Bible in the book of Esther which contains every letter of the alphabet except whatever it is, uh, X, I think, or something. It tells you the shortest verse in the Bible is the one which has two words, Jesus wept. And the middle verse of the, Bible, of the Bible is in the book of Psalms, and so on and so on. All kinds of things which are like games you play. It doesn't mean anything. You talk about an English translation of the Bible, saying the longest sentence is this, the shortest is that, there's this many words in that chapter, and this many in that chapter, and so on. What value is that? But somebody may memorize all of this, or they may tell you, I can name the 12 sons of Jacob. Or I can name you all of the books of the Bible. Uh, I can do that too, but <laughs> what, what difference does it make? That doesn't mean you know a great deal more about the Bible in the sense of, do you understand what does it mean to tell you? It means you have a lot of the facts. There are people who claim to have memorized every word in it. They say, you name the chapter and verse, I'll tell you what it says in that place. It doesn't necessarily mean they, they know what's going on in there any more than a word processor knows what <laughs> is in it. It's all in there but you just regurgitate it, you just bring it back out. To go back to ancient history for a minute, there is uh, this point that I had suggested, that there's a kind of a, an embarrassment that stands. You'll find this sort of thing documented in uh, many books, and it's not in dispute by a, a lot of people, that there's basically just about no feature of Christianity that is not also found in some other religion, right back to ancient times. One of the gospel accounts says that uh, when John the Baptist saw Jesus, he told everyone, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Do you know, for centuries before the time of Jesus, and at that time and even after that time, all around the Mediterranean, there were people who worshipped Mithras, the Mithraic cult uh, out of Persia. That was the official title of Mithras, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He said, this is somebody who was crucified for our sins and raised up, and so on. It was an old story. One of the gods the Greeks worshipped was a son of God called Bacchus. His official title was the Alpha and the Omega. In the Bible book of Revelation says of Jesus, he's the Alpha and the Omega, or it applies it to someone who they say is Jesus. But if you see what I mean, these were already familiar ideas. They have uh, parallels in other places. You have Baal, Adonis, Osiris, different gods worship in different places. When Cortez came to the New World hundreds of years ago, and he found out what the Indians were worshipping, he sent word back to Europe. He said, the devil has taught these people everything Jesus taught us. Because they had the same religion, just different names. The same basic ideas. Now, I know that's often a challenge. Of people, some people say, well, it's not true. These other things, they were fertility cults, or they were this, or they were that. Whatever they were, there are these parallels. They may say, oh, but those people had a dirty story. <laughs> we have a clean story. Well, sometimes beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Probably looked very beautiful to the people who worshipped Mithras and Bacchus. It didn't look dirty or uh, anything. Probably was very symbolic to them and easily got moved over into Christianity. At least it's a theory. How do people explain it? Usually they'll tell you it's the work of the devil. So the devil knew how things were going to go. So for years ahead of time, he started getting people to believe in similar things so that you could say this today, <laughs> so that you could try to embarrass me by saying, here are counterfeits of the true religion in many places. Maybe. But the Muslim is not faced with that. It's also true that you can look through history, and in every 
time and place you can find some people somewhere who they were practicing a religion which seems to be Islamic in everything except name. Looks very much like what Muslims believe. What does the Muslim say? It's the work of the devil. No. The Muslim says, Alhamdulillah. says, thank God, I thought so. The Quran tells me that every nation had a prophet who told people the truth. If you bring me proof that in this place somebody told them that, I tell you, yes, that confirms what I believe. It's not an embarrassment for the Muslim. If you find some ancient religion resembling Islam, it's more what you should expect to find. Now, there is also the interesting attitude that some will tell you that uh, it's true that some of the customs that are in some churches were pagan customs which have been brought into the church, and the phrase used is, uh, they will say that, but those things were sanctified by their adoption into the church. They were made holy because the church took them. Um, again, that <laughs> doesn't solve very much, I suppose. Uh, it's simply an answer, which may or may not be true, but it's the kind of thing that a, once more a person doesn't have a, a basis for it. They can't open up the Bible and find a place where it says, God will, from time to time, give you permission to take pagan customs and make them your own. And they'll be, that's okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, or something like that. So you see, it, it may be that some pagan thing can become holy. It sounds strange to me, but it may be, but it's not a thing anybody can bring you the text that says so. It's not a thing you can stand fast on. Uh, there's also this point that uh, should be stressed that if you try to point out that, well, the Bible doesn't seem to say much about uh, Trinitarian doctrine, and somebody tells you, well, yes, this is the thing that people figured out within the next two or three centuries after the time of Jesus. They took these words, they thought about it, the Spirit guided them, and so on, and they came to figure this out. They're telling you it's an evolved doctrine. If anybody ever tells you that, remember that he said that. Maybe it is, but remember that he said that, because this is likely to be the same man who, on another occasion, will tell you, Jesus used to walk up and down Palestine telling everyone he was God. See, it can be one way or the other, or neither way. You can't have it both ways. Either it was delivered wholesale by Jesus, or it evolved later, or neither. <laughs> but it isn't both. It isn't like he explained the whole thing, and it evolved. So if a person says it's evolved, then he does not have permission to go through and say, here's where Jesus explained it. No. I mentioned uh, this morning, I guess, that half of the problem seemed to be that people had left what was clear and gone toward what was ambiguous, as explained in this ayah, the Quran, where it talks about that some things are locked in place, they're clear, others may be ambiguous if you overlook the clear things, the things that clear them up, you go to the ambiguous references. This ayah was talking about the verses which are muhkamat and mutashabihat. In fact, that word is often mistranslated in Arabic, it seems, mutashabihat, they put ambiguous or something that is not really quite suitable. This is the word in the second surah reported by uh, Bani Israel, used a form of this word when they were told, sacrifice a cow. They said, which one? They all look alike. And they used a form of shabha. They say, you mean the yellow one or a different color? And so on. That one cow looks like another cow. Maybe this, maybe that. Same thing in regard to verses, that it could mean this or could mean that. And you're going to be led into error if you don't try and figure out what it means by referring to the things that you have locked in place, the ones you can be certain of. In any case, if that's half the problem of the various kinds of religion that you find, the other half would seem to be from the explanation given in the sixth surah, right around the 113th ayah, where apparently in response to questions Muslim must, uh, must have had at uh, one time, when the Muslim community would think that, well, we are the community with guidance, uh, and this community has no guidance. What about the people who come from that community into ours, but they don't really believe, but they come and go with us? Do they have guidance? And the answer is that, well, the person does not gain much by simply associating with the community. He has to become part of the community. And it was explained in this way that the ayah says, for every prophet, 
kulli nabi, for every prophet, including the last of them, for every prophet, Allah says, we have raised up from among men and jinn opposers or satans to tell fancy stories about them, the prophets, so that people in whose hearts there is no belief in the hereafter might be inclined toward the fancy stories and get to believing them, and they finish where they're supposed to finish. In other words, the reason that these people don't have guidance is because they may associate with the community, but instead of listening to the message, they start thinking all kinds of strange things about the messenger. The emphasis moves from the message to the messenger. It's a matter of, instead of what is preached, it becomes who did the preaching. The preacher becomes the preached. In fact, the Christian church recognizes this now in centers uh, where they uh, talk about the issue. They give it a name. They call it the kerygma problem. And it's kerygma, which has to do with preaching. It's a question they ask. They say, Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, and then everyone who came after him talked about Jesus. They say, how'd that happen? He said this, then they talked about him. How did the preacher get to be the one that the preaching is all about? How did the emphasis shift? They call it the uh, kerygma problem. What happens when you do that, of course, when you move the emphasis over from the message to the messenger, is that... Uh, biographies and stories about whoever the messenger is start to become more important than the message. And you get into a competition for uh, who can tell the most beautiful story of the messenger instead of who remembers what he said. Uh, what was his message? That's why there were so many gospels written, I suppose, about Jesus. Somebody wanted to tell the story even better. And it comes down to today where there's a song called I Love to Tell the Old, Old Story where uh, People love to tell the story. Whether or not everybody's heard it or not doesn't matter. It's the storytelling that's of value. It's not so much what did he say. It means, too, that a biography has to be expanded and given meanings. That is, it may be actually true that uh, on one occasion Jesus said, uh, if you honor me, you honor God. It may be true he said that, but you have to, if you put the emphasis on the messenger, start to inflate that to say, well, probably he, what he meant was he is God. So you start to blow up the meanings. Down to today now, the various divisions of people and even into cults, they repeat what is a familiar process. That is the process of private interpretation. It is where an individual says, I have a new insight on these old words. And he gives it some kind of a meaning, a private interpretation. They are, in doing this today, following in a long chain of people who did this. About 300 years before the time of Jesus, the Greeks met the Jews. And Alexander's armies came through there. And when they ask these Jews uh, about their religious beliefs, the Jews tell them some stories about the prophets and things, and the Greeks ridiculed that. They said, how immature. They say, back in our society, we have philosophers, have had for a long time, and they discuss issues, and uh, they have all sorts of vocabulary for concepts which you people don't seem to have ever heard of. And the Jews, many of them in their embarrassment, tried to somehow make their religion look more sophisticated to say, well, it's true that we have stories about prophets and the people who wandered in the desert and this man went here, he killed a lion and this man came here and he <laughs> blew the walls down from a city and that. Say, but each of these things has a symbolic meaning. It's much more philosophical than just stories of people coming and going in the desert. Symbolic. And that word in English comes from the old Latin terminology and languages before that, which means literally throw together. See, the... Um, those thousands of years ago, uh, a man may have, uh, in the army, may meet with his king and say, I'm leaving, I'll send you a message. But before he leaves, he may take a, a, a dish and break it. Give the king one piece, he takes the other piece. So that when he later sends his messenger to the king, that man comes with a broken piece of the dish. And the king sees, uh, this piece fits with that piece, this is the real messenger. So he threw them together, Sym symbolic. <laughs> See, related to why you, you 
patch the symbols of the musical instrument. You throw these things together. Symbolic means you take this, you take this, and you make it into that. So you throw these things together. That was for 300 years now the tradition of many Jews to say, well, this thing and this thing together, they mean that thing. They were in that habit. So that you come to a person like Paul, who filled his letters that way in the Bible, of saying that the things that happened then were symbols of later things. He says in one place, in the story where Moses hit the rock and the water came out, that's not just a story about water and rock. See, the rock meant this and the water meant that. And he gives it a symbolic kind of a meaning. It's an old habit. There's a warning against that kind of thing in the Bible, in the first letter of Peter. And what's interesting here is this is virtually always misused. Sometimes you ask somebody uh, about the origin of the Bible, and they'll tell you it all came from God. It says here in 1 Peter, no interpretation or no, no prophecy of Scripture ever came by private interpretation, but men spoke as they were born along by the Spirit of God. What they seem to be wanting to tell you is no prophet ever wrote anything except God told him what to write. But read carefully. What Peter's talking about is nobody who ever had a Scripture in front of him ever read it and gave it a meaning a proper meaning without God helped him do this thing. He's talking about the interpretation, not the writing of Scripture. He's talking about the understanding of Scripture it has to come with God's help. And yet, having missed that point, many people have given private interpretations to Scripture. Probably the beginning of that in modern times is the thing called the Schofield Reference Bible, which uh, dates from the last century, or Schofield and... Uh, compatriots, I guess, <laughs> went through the Bible and they had a great many comments to make on a great many things all the way through. It's filled with footnotes and commentaries and uh, appendices and so on to say, well, this means that, this, that, and so on. And that was the start of people coming to interpret things to where now you'll find, uh, I'm sure, you look in the, the newspaper and uh, the weekend advertisements for church services and from time to time you'll find a local church who this weekend they're having a prophetic conference means people are coming from all around. They're going to tell you about new ideas they've had that are prophecies, private interpretation of Scripture. In still more recent times, I suppose you could say that originated with somebody in the first part of the last century whose name was Miller, and he was not a relative. Uh, <laughs> I promise you, my grandfather changed my last name or the family's last name to Miller about 50 years ago. So. <laughs> My ancestors weren't named Miller. <laughs> but this Miller uh, was uh, an American who, according to his understanding of what he read in the Bible, came to the conclusion that Jesus is coming Saturday morning at 9 o'clock, or whatever. He pinned it down to an exact date, place, time. He convinced a few people of that. And they dressed up in white robes, and they went on the hillside to wait for him. He didn't come to take them away. And they call that... Some called it the great disappointment. But instead of being the end of something, that was the beginning of something, where a lot of people said, well, no, he had the right idea, he just miscalculated. And so the calculations continue till now. People still say, oh, it's going to happen then or then. Or maybe they won't specify the date, but they tell you it will happen in this way. They fall into, at least in fundamentalist circles now, two groups. Now, keep in mind, I keep using this word fundamentalist. This can mean a wide range of people, too. But basically, it's people who they say, we are fundamentalists because we follow the fundamentals of Christianity. We believe as the Christians did way back in the beginning. We stick to the fundamentals. That's not where the name came from, the nickname fundamentalist. Most of them don't seem to be aware that that nickname came a few generations ago because of a series of little pamphlets that were printed called the fundamentals. They disagree on some of the fine details, and they spend a lot of time at it now. Uh, they fall, broadly speaking, into two schools of thought on the end of the world. You have the pre-tribulationists and the post-tribulationists. Some who believe that, well, a great time of trouble is coming to the earth, but just before it starts, Jesus will come and take away his followers, and everybody else will have to live through this. The others say, no, no, we all live through this, and then Jesus comes and takes us away, and so on and they argue about the details of this. But this may explain why some people will have this attitude. I don't, maybe you have seen a, a bumper sticker on the back of uh, 
a car, or I have seen it in some cars where on the passenger side, the man puts a sticker warning his passenger. It says, be ready to take the wheel, the driver may disappear. Or it's a warning to cars following, caution, driver may disappear. What they mean is Jesus may come while this man is driving and take him away, so look out. This car will suddenly no, have no driver. That refers to this uh, issue of uh, the pre-tribulation. Jesus is going to come snatch people away. Muslims are not immune to this kind of thing, you know, peculiar interpretations of things. It goes on till now. Uh, no matter what a person says, he can always find someone who will believe him. Always. I would feel confident enough to guarantee you that uh, uh, whatever outrageous claim I make, I can bring you somebody by next week who will tell you I'm right. You can always find somebody. He may be insane, but I can find somebody who will tell you I'm right. So in a similar way, you have, even within the Muslim community, within the Christian community, people may have some of the very strangest ideas. Those don't really represent Islam or Christianity, but they try to tie it to that and then lead people into their peculiar ideas. Somebody called at my door one day telling me about Islam. And he offered me a newspaper, and he says, it's in Arabic. You see, English and Arabic is like electricity. English is lies. It reads from left to right. But Arabic reads from right to left, like positive and negative, you see. Arabic tells truth, English lies. This is insane. Doesn't mean a lot of people don't believe it. You see, it, it goes on. And uh, why I'm suggesting that we should be aware of these kinds of things is that not everything that claims to be Christian or Muslim is. It may try to tie itself to it, but uh, be careful. Uh, it always kind of worries me when somebody comes and tells me about some silly thing some Christian said. Well, probably if he went back and told his pastor in his church that thing, his pastor would tell him he's silly. It doesn't mean they automatically believe that thing. You have uh, an active group called the Worldwide Church of God. You have Jehovah's Witnesses. You have the Mormons who will call themselves Christian, but by and large, most Christians know one thing for sure, these people are not Christians. They, they feel that way. So don't run these things together. So in particular, you have a certain type of person who will say, anybody who calls himself a Christian, that's all right. That starts to narrow to some people who say, no, no, lots of people who say they're Christians are not. The true Christians are the ones who believe this, this, this. And among them, they'll narrow it even more to say, no, no, only the ones who go to that building are the true Christians. They may bring it right down to that. Say, these are false. So you can't blur these distinctions. And, and I mentioned these three in particular because they are usually most often pointed to because the worldwide church of God doesn't have a trinity. God is two, not three. Uh, Jehovah's Witnesses say God is one, but he does have a son. Uh, the Mormons will tell you that God used to be like you. And then he grew into God. Someday you'll grow into what he is. Of course, by that time, he'll be even better than he is now. And so on. I mean, it's a strange idea, and it's offensive to a lot of uh, Christians. So you may meet a wide variety of different things. You know, try and sort those out to say, well, this man must be one of that type. It takes a lot of work. You also have visionaries, that is, uh, there are people who don't want to discuss any issues at all, but they will tell you they can work miracles and so on. Uh, there's another application to the scripture reference that uh, Brother Yusuf mentioned earlier about this place where Jesus says, Many will come to me on that last day saying, Lord, Lord, we did wonderful works in your name, and I'll tell them, Get away from me, I never knew you. One application of that seems to be there's going to be some people who, who are going to claim, We used to work miracles in the name of Jesus. And I'm going to tell them on that day, I never knew you, get away. That should be of some concern, at least, to a Christian church where they're having miracles on a regular basis, where they tell you, every Saturday night we heal cripples. Uh, I'd be a little cautious about that. Who are these people that Jesus says are going to claim they did miracles all the time? But he says, I didn't know you. Be careful. You have the, uh, as Reverend Moon, this too is a kind of a different version of Christianity is, is a man who said he had a vision of Jesus who told him what to do. That's, you don't usually find church founders saying that, but in this case there is. 
when he was on trial a couple of years ago for income tax problems. He was explaining how did he come to get this message, how did Jesus speak to him, and he said, uh, he came to me, talked to me, and the lawyer examining him said, how did you know it was Jesus, or the Messiah? How did you know it was the Messiah speaking to you? He said, I recognized him from his picture. Well, of course, he's talking about various paintings that are traditionally made of Jesus, but uh, nobody ever drew a portrait of him that I, I know of, certainly none that's still around. You have other people who have taken certain socially uh, progressive ideas, I suppose they would say, and tried to match those up with Christianity, so that they are great ones for encouraging people to do great things and be achievers and earn money and be successful, and it's only very loosely connected to Christianity. They may set up a thing called a church, but really if you listen to what's going on, there's not very much in there about a church. I think that maybe covers uh, things. Uh, maybe there's some group that you've heard of and you're curious about and you might suggest it. If I know, I can tell you something. I just hope that uh, finally the impression I've given you is that it's a wide range of people and how it came to be that way that call themselves Christian. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Gary. And uh, uh, finally, I guess, we'll have the uh, final question and answer period. So if you have any question, please uh, come on and uh, get clear closer to the uh, microphone, it's uh, better also to state your name and then your question. Right. My name is Mustafa. Uh, Brother Gary, there is a verse in the Quran, one of the Christian scholars, if you can call him, whatever, he referred to it that, and the meaning of the ayah says, uh, telling Rasulullah, Muhammad if you are in doubt of what we have revealed to you, go to the, pe the, go ask, to the people of the world. Ask the people of the world. Or ask the people of the world. I don't know what is your response to that. Uh, I suppose there's a couple of points to be made. The, the one I was uh, suggesting earlier today has application here. That is, Remember what I said about Jesus as reported in John chapter 5 when he said to the Jews, you read the scriptures all the time. You think in there is the key to eternal life. But I'm telling you, if you read it more carefully, you'd be listening to me because what's in there tells you about me. So the point was he was not endorsing their opinion. He might have even agreed with the opinion, but he didn't say so at that point. He's saying, you read this book all the time, never mind whether it's true or false. Have you noticed in there where it tells you about me? In the same way, this is supposed to be the direction toward their books in the Quran, to say, uh, as you have mentioned, in one ayah mentions that the Quran is mentioned in previous revelations. And another ayah says, this prophet, this last prophet, is mentioned in previous revelations. And that's at least part of the application of then the ayah that you mentioned, which is telling this man, if you doubt it, go ask them about it see what they say. Now, on that subject, as one non-Muslim observed, uh, this seems to tell a very important story because it may well have been that uh, the Christians in Medina at that time used the same books that they use today for a Bible, maybe. But as one non-Muslim scholar reviewing this has suggested, here was a chance for the Christians to prove this man was a fake, and they didn't take it. Why not? The Quran is revealed piece by piece. It's recited. People are, are given this information, Muslim, non-Muslim alike. They hear this. As this man had pointed out, uh, this, I believe, was Muir's comment. He said, uh, why is it then that the day when this revelation came, or one of the revelations came that said, the last of the prophets is mentioned in their books. Why didn't some Christians say, you're wrong? Look, come with me now. In fact, you go ahead of me to my house. Help yourself to my books. Look through them all. Nothing in there. Go ahead, go. I won't stop you. You could say, I just heard this for the first time. I don't have time to go and hide the books. Go and look. But nobody did. See, they must have been afraid of something. Why didn't they take up this challenge to say, 
this time you've gone too far. I can prove you wrong because here are my books and there's nothing in there about you. What were they afraid of? Muir, I believe it was Muir, I'm not for sure, uh, had suggested that maybe what this means is that one of the books that the Christians were using at that time had a very clear reference to the last of the prophets, so they kept quiet on this subject. Uh, even today, though, the Muslim would still point out there's many indications that you have uh, a great deal of trouble in making all of these things fit somebody else. You know, there's an interesting situation that exists uh, even now in Nablus, uh, the West Bank Territory, I think, Nablus. Anybody know Nablus? Yeah. <laughs> uh, you have in that city some uh, Samaritans. These are people who are descended from people who, in very ancient times, accepted the first five books of the Jewish books, and no more after that, just the first five. So the Jews don't regard them as Jews. But they took just the first five books and they built a religion around this and they exist, I think they say, about 400 families till now. In, the first, in book number five, <laughs> there is a place there, which probably you all have heard uh, talks on the subject. Chapter 18, the book of Deuteronomy, is saying to uh, Moses, Musa, alayhi salam, uh, God is uh, telling him, someday I'll raise up a prophet from among your brothers like me, listen to him, etc. Do you know that the Samaritans in their tafsir, that is their commentaries on their scriptures, in this place they have a footnote which says probably that prophet is Muhammad ibn Abdullah who came to the Arabs. <laughs> what they don't seem to continue through is to understand, well he didn't just come to them, but that even is their understanding. <laughs> they can look at this and see that it seems very obvious that this can be the meaning to this, so probably when it says that prophet, that's who it means. That's an interesting observation made by somebody without Muslims pushing them into this. They'd probably maybe rather not say that, but that's their conclusion of it, and that's in line with what you're talking about. That it's told the prophet, if you're in doubt about these things, go ask. And the lesson might not be so much in that you will see where it says that, the real lesson might be in that people will say, I don't want to talk about it. That might tell a story, too. <laughs> Sorry to take so long on that. Come in, sir. Uh, my name is Sadiq, and I have a question for either of you in uh, regards to Catholic faith. What I want to know is, um, what, what, Seriously, should we take the Book of Barnabas, Barnabas uh, as Muslims? Is it authentic, or has it been authenticated? And, and maybe you could tell us something about it. You know, uh, 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 the, actually, the problem with accepting the six extra books and the pieces of uh, the two other books, I guess, in the Catholic Bible, the Protestant basically bases that on saying that, but this is a decision made years later. He's saying to include those books is a, is a decision somebody made long after we had already agreed which would be uh, the right books. Uh, that's basically it. Uh, he may pursue that point to try to say, and in fact, the reasons that we object are these, and he may mention something. Usually the only one, uh, the, the most common one, that is suggested is they tell uh, from the book of Tobit or Tobias, they'll say there's a story there about a, which they say is too much like a fairy tale, that a man was sleeping and a bird's nest fell on his eyes and blinded him and so the story goes and so on. They say that's too fantastic of a story. It couldn't really happen, which is interesting because some of the other books that are there tell some strange <laughs> stories. I'll tell you about a man who was riding his donkey and the donkey turned around and started talking to him and, and so on. I'm, I might be tempted to think maybe this doesn't belong in there either. If, you know, by the same standards, if that's how you judge. Uh, Barnabas is not, of course, among those books. That's another uh, issue. Um, but there are some mistakes in the book which show that whatever its origin, it's suffered somewhat the same fate as other books. It's passed through some hands. 
what's useful about it to me, but it's only a personally, is that it explains a lot of things. There are, as I mentioned, uh, some of the things that are called the difficult sayings are Je of Jesus are things which he said which were riddles that he didn't answer. The answers to the riddles are in the book of Barnabas in many cases. They may not be even the right answers, but at least they give an answer to what seemed to be impossible. According to the Bible, on different occasions, Jesus would stumble his enemies or something he'd uh, say, uh, doesn't it say this and that in the scriptures? Then how can this be so? And they couldn't answer, so they left. But he doesn't answer either. <laughs> in the book of Barnabas are some nice answers to these things. So I appreciate it for that reason. Uh, it tends to put a certain degree of credibility on it. But at the same time, it also seems to say, uh, in one place, uh, putting words in the mouth of Jesus, saying, I'm not the Messiah. Well, that's an un-Islamic position. So if that's the accurate translation of what's there, then this is passed through some other hands that have put this in there, if it was uh, true in the first place. The, about the, the only thing that you'll ever prove to a non-Muslim, or to a Muslim for that matter, from the book of Barnabas, is to uh, show him what he may not have known before, that there are more than four Gospels, that's all. To say, oh, but here's number five, and give me time, I'll bring you ten more. <laughs> there's, there's lots more. In the Roman Catholic Douay version of the Bible, uh, which was first published in 1582, uh, they have um, a total of one extra book there. There's 73 books. And um, in the Protestant versions, there's 66. The names of the books, uh, of the seven books which are in the Roman Catholic version and omitted uh, in the King James version and other Protestant versions are the Book of Baruch, of Judith, of Tobias, 1st Maccabees, 2nd Maccabees, Wisdom, and Ecclesiasticus. Um, just one more point I'd just like to add, uh, which is actually uh, restating what Brother Gary Miller had stated uh, earlier on about this word muhaminan in the Quran. Uh, and Brother Gary Miller had uh, uh, already stated that it is quality control. So in relation to all previous scripture, um, the Qur'an is muhaiminan. That is, whatever the Qur'an, uh, you know, contradicts, so it will deny, it will reject it. Uh, whatever it, uh, it confirms, that is okay, it's genuine. So we find this phenomenon of, uh, uh, for example, Trinity, that uh, 1400 years ago, the Qur'an stated, وَلَا تَقُولُ ثَلَاثَةَ And don't say Trinity, إِنْتَهُ خَيْرًا لَكُمْ Desist, stop it, it will be better for you. Innam Allahu ilahu ahid, for your God is one God. This is in chapter 4, verse 171. Now, in the uh, 20th century, you'll find that in the modern versions of the Bible, which are based now on the most ancient manuscripts, manuscripts written nearer to the time of Jesus, uh, that all these words, for there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one, are now omitted. It's omitted from the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, from the New International Version of the Bible, and the Oxford Version of the Bible. Uh, bringing out this point Brother Gary Miller had stated earlier about Muhaminan, this phenomenon, making it more significant, that 1400 years ago the Quran rejected this as a reject, as inauthentic. Uh, in the 20th century that's confirmed. Now, the degree to which the Quran is, uh, you know, Muhaminan in relation to previous scripture, whatever it accepts, uh, it would uh, say it's authentic. So the Quran is also muhaiminan in relation to the Gospel of Barnabas. That is an important point to bear in mind. Uh, whatever confirms with the Quran, we would accept it, and whatever uh, disagree, the Quran contradicts and denies, we would reject, as Brother Mar Gary Miller said about Al Masih. Go ahead. This is the last question, inshallah. Uh, there's a question, there's a man who pointed out to Brother Yusuf in one of his new lecture about uh, why Jesus crucified, and when he quoted the verse, there shall be no sign unto it, and it goes on three days and three nights. And the man was pointing out about the time factor, but he didn't ask the question. I would like to ask that question. You are saying you emphasize on the being not dead, being alive. But he said I could also 
emphasize on the three days and three nights. Would you rather do that? Yeah, did you get this question? Did you get this question? Yeah. See, the point is uh, the Christian wants to now try and give an interpretation. And uh, he's trying to say that it's not really uh, the miracle that is important. It's the miracle is, he's trying to say, the time factor. If Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so Jesus was three days and three nights. How they were in there, it doesn't really matter. Um, if that is really the point, the emphasis is on three days and three nights, then one merely needs to analyze uh, whether Jesus was really three days and three nights in the tomb. Um, he's supposed to have been put into the tomb on Friday evening because there was a hurry to get his body down according to the evidence as given in the Gospels. This is an important point. We're not stating it as our evidence. Um, so he was put into the tomb, according to the Bible, on Friday evening. So we need to count how many days and how many nights. Friday evening, he's supposed to be in the tomb. Friday night, one night. Then Saturday day, he's supposed to be in the tomb. Supposed to be. Right? I'll explain supposed to be why just now. He's supposed to be in the tomb, Saturday day. One night and one day. Um, sat Saturday night, he's supposed to be in the tomb, supposed to be. Sunday morning, when Mary Magdalene, according to the Bible, when she goes to the tomb, she finds that the tomb was empty. So how many nights and how many days? Two nights and one day. So if the Christian wants to emphasize and say this is the time factor that was fulfilled, so let's analyze it. And really, while we can show that the time factor hasn't been fulfilled, you know, just to refute that type of explanation the Christian is trying to give, the real thrust is that there is nothing miraculous in the time factor. You know, it, takes, it took me three hours from here to Colombia by car. So when I get to Colombia, say, hippie puree, you know, three hours, it took me, it's a miracle. Time factor is no miracle. The miracle is as Jonah was in the belly of the whale, as Jesus said. If Jonah was dead, there's no miracle, because we expected him to be dead. Whether he was there for three days, four days, or two days. If he was dead, there's no miracle. If he was alive when we expected him to be dead, then it's a miracle. Similarly, if Jesus was dead, as the Christians are telling us, according to their witnesses, if he was dead, whether for five days or ten days, it's no miracle. But if he was alive, when we similarly expected him to be dead, then that's the miracle. So you refute the time factor on that uh, basis. And uh, actually the real trust of that, uh, those uh, uh, verses in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38, 39, 40, is about Jonah being alive when we expected him to be dead, therefore Jesus ought to be alive. And the most strongly the Christians argue that Jesus was dead, the stronger grounds the Jews have for rejecting him as the Messiah. This is the point. Uh, the other point, just to clear up uh, the question about crucifixion, the uh, brother had mentioned, uh, what is the Islamic position about the details? Uh, you know, if the Quran says, وَمَا قَتَلُوهُ وَمَا صَلَبُوهُ They didn't kill him, nor did they crucify him. So what really happened? Um, brother Gary Miller and I, we are trying to, you know, really search uh, the minds of uh, our questioners, really to figure out what was the point that was trying to be obtained. You see, the Christ, uh, uh, one of the things we, which we have concluded is probably the idea is that uh, the Christians, uh, you know, have a solid uh, point of view about the details. The point is that there are four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. These, these are the names given to these Gospels. And there are four different accounts. The details differ in each of these Gospels. So we need to present it to the Christian and say, look, you tell us what the details are and try as much as they want they will never be able to give you a coherent account because each gospel is giving a different explanation about uh, going to the tomb on sunday uh, morning uh, one gospel says that it was mary magdalene that went alone to the tomb another gospel says that it was three of them another gospel says it was two of them so in all the other details too there is a lot of difference about uh, jesus how long he was on the cross one gospel says it was uh, six hours, another gospel says he was three hours on the cross. 
So details, they haven't got that clear, cleared up themselves. Uh, we just before we conclude, uh, I'll just uh, just to uh, add to this point. I would ask you kindly to comment on it. As uh, Sayyid Qutb, uh, in his interpretation of the Quran, was saying that uh, because of the pr Islam is a practical religion, you know, it's it's a kind of uh, uh, what does it mean to the Muslim to be three hours, four hours, five hours, or what are those details are going to be of any benefit to the Muslims? Because it's a practical religion, and whenever God mentions something, you're going to be acting accordingly. What is your action going to be if you know the details? It doesn't mean anything to you, the details. So what would you say about that? Just to finish up. The, the point is that if, if you know the details, or, or the value that you can have is as a historical uh, fact. That's the value. But it's not... Uh, you know, equated, t taken up to the level of being the word of God. The Quran states he was neither killed nor crucified. If you wish to analyze and go into the details, uh, if you come to some type of conclusion, uh, which you feel is the best type of conclusion or, or the best possibility, then all that point of view or that detail would be to the Muslim is as a historical de detail. Nothing more. It won't be the word of God. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Brother Gary and Brother Yusuf, for uh, this interesting workshop. We hope uh, that may Allah accept it uh, from you and from all of us over here. And uh, I thank you all for uh, coming and participating in uh, this discussion and in this workshop. And we hope to see you, inshallah, on uh, Monday in the uh, dialogue. Also, Brother Gary Miller will give another lecture on Tuesday titled Christianity and Islam and will be in the uh, J-Hawk room at 7.30 on Tuesday. So we'll hope to, uh, we hope to see you all there on Monday, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.